Yeah, but I don't have any hope in it at this point. Yeah. I've been surprised too many times by what looked like bigger problems that didn't turn out to be bigger problems. Hi everyone, Matthew Cruz here, filling in for Marlon Bowling, who's out on vacation this week. So I have with me uh, the very well-known Eric Snodgrass. Eric, how are you doing today? Hey, not bad. It's just windy and dusty where I am in the Corn Belt. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at folks that have too much rain going, man, I wish we could share some of that. So yeah, pretty good though. Okay, well, very good. So, well, we got most of the the U.S. crop is planted. Uh, you know, over ninety percent in the corn, close to ninety percent in the beans already. So, you know, we're, we're on my farm. I already got it's already up and and got the the nitrogen on and post emerge uh, herbicide on. So, not a lot I can do going forward. Just kind of looking to the skies and the forecast, and and uh, you know, it's it's in Mother Nature's hands now. So. Um, you know, I look at some of the the drought maps, and and it looks like there's less than five percent of corn areas in some sort of drought. Which, you know, I haven't been doing this forever, but that, it seems to be it's been a long time since we've been at at that five percent or less level. It seems like um, I don't know what are you, what are your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, my thoughts are like when you and I were together in early March. What were we talking about on stage? Right? Is there's this 60% chance that we were going to be seeing drought conditions developing in the Western Corn Belt. We were expecting really tight windows in the Eastern Corn Belt and the Ohio River Valley. You know, we got that. We did get that happen. And yeah, there was drought back in parts of April and early May in Nebraska, really nasty dry. I mean, they were running their pivots early in the season just to keep up with the water. But you know, the, 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 the spot we missed and I missed it. I shouldn't say we, the spot I missed was part of the, you know, the Southern Plains. You go to the Red River of the South, they got massive rainfall that came in in April. Then they had another big event, two big events in May. And now we've got them forecast to be wet again here in, uh, you, you know, as we go forward into this new month of June. And so, yeah, we've seen this drought, this, this, this drought reduction. And we just sit here and wonder, well, there was so much preseason worry about drought. Where, where is it? Okay. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to share my screen. I want to show you something here. Let's just go do this real quick. Let's go look at some stats. I like this. This is what was missed. This we got right. And yep. this we got right. And this we got right. But take a look. So this goes from March 31st to June 2nd. And take a look at this area here that's been dry. They've had just-in-time rains in this region to kind of keep the crop going yeah. and looking pretty good. But here's my point behind all of this. Every major, major, like I'm talking the 12s, the 88s, the 83s, the 80s, you know, the big, big, big droughts that hit this area, they were all preceded with a drought in that box. Okay. And we don't yep. have it. We just don't have it right now. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the drought monitor. I actually want to go look at it real quick. Let's go have a just look at a drought monitor. Um, and we can do a couple of things. Let's go to ag and droughts. And let's, uh, once this loads, let's look at row crops. This should bring up a table for us. There we go. So I've got total corn production at 23%. But remember, you may be looking at those like primary corn and soybean acres, and then yeah. that's quite a bit different. So if we actually look at the maps and we go to corn, I mean, just take a look at it. You've got acreage here that can be irrigated yeah. that's in drought. And we've just let this slide into some abnormally dry conditions. But remember, there's Chicago and, and you know, yep. the, the, there's a lot in there that's not just uh, ag land. But yeah. you look at that overall and say, if you wanted to have a problem, it needed to already be here. And it is not there. We have super saturated, soupy soils. In fact, if you look at the soil moisture values right now, OK, there's still some deficits deep down here, but there's nothing impeding any future Gulf moisture getting into this area. And I think that's going to be. That's going to be a big story going forward. What do you think? Yeah, I you know that's what we're we're looking at now is there's people complaining in Ohio of of flooding oh, yeah. and, and the planting is delayed there. Oh, I, you know I gave those numbers overall that you know we're ahead of schedule. But I'm sure if there's someone in Ohio watching this, they're like ahead of schedule. What are you talking about? I only got half yeah. my crop in, and and now it's June, and and so you know there's always the haves and the have nots, but. Uh, you know, from a market perspective, we got to look at it as a whole. Is is how is how are we doing? And and it it just seems like yeah, there's wet areas, um, but there's a whole lot of area that was 
started out dry and has now you know gotten a couple inches and so is is they're they're getting along we're not we don't have we haven't built our and my my farm in northwest iowa is one of those areas where um you know we don't maybe don't have a full soil moisture profile but we're we're so far so good we're getting by we're you know we're getting another inch or two this week and and uh, yeah. the other thing too is it you know it's still early right the the temperatures yeah. are still cool and so yeah. the real uh challenge is july and august um but to i've always felt to do well in july and august you gotta get a good jump start on the crop and get the root down deep in in you know in may and june if possible and so well, here's the thing. You mentioned temperatures. I just brought up a map of, of what happened at the end of May, right, to the beginning of June. We had a lot of cold air get in here. And those guys in Ohio, yeah, they have every right to complain. They had a, what, a top top eight coldest finishes to May, and it was super wet there, which means they're very delayed. They're off by, a, you know, compared to last year by like 200 GDDs on a crop that they don't even have yet in the ground. And, uh, and and you're right. I mean, you you may be in where there's a little bit of soil moisture deficit, but um, you've been getting enough rains to get by. I'm just curious. I'm going to bring something up here. I've been working on a kind of a uh, a test product. What what town? By the way, that's the radar right now as the rain's coming in. Uh, g- give me a town where you are there in uh, northern Iowa. Royal. Let's go to Royal Iowa. Let's see here. Iowa. I just got a, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> There well, I got you right there in Royal Iowa. So if you look at look at it's 58 by the way <laughs> on June the third where you are. Yeah, yeah. But you know you're you're at 82 percent of your year to date rainfall. Okay, so okay. and you're right. I've got over the next seven days another 1.7 to 1.9 inches. But look at this. You're only expected to get 97 GDDs in the next seven days. So this again, you're asking about is my crop getting off to a really good start? Uh, kind of. But not yeah. not the best. Now I'm going to scroll pretty quickly here because I want to get past all these forecast metrics I've got. We can look at them all later if you want. But I want to show you this. This is how critical your next 15 days of rain are, because right now, like we said, you're off. You're off normal right there. But we've got multiple events coming in the next 15 days to try to take you back up to here. And why that's so important is your year-to-date precipitation minus evaporation. That April into May timeframe brought you way down here to be about five inches off when you factor in the evaporation. So we need this to start working its way back up to that zero line in order to kind of get you out of the woods for, for, for this risk. And you're right. There's, there's some good moisture that's coming in. In fact, I got there. It is. There's a preset map uh, for the next uh, seven days. And if we just if we think hard on the Corn Belt. Let's go ahead and look at it. I mean, shoot, no, there's not going to be a whole lot of people complaining about getting that rain in there unless you're in Missouri yeah. or Kansas or Oklahoma. But yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm seeing in the near term. So, so when we were in Denver at the Commodity Classic, I mean, you indicated there was 60% chance of a, yeah. more of a drier uh, space in the western Corn Belt and wetter in the east. Do you, you, you still see that same thing happening now that we're uh, getting a little bit closer? Well, so there's still a few things going on here. Let me give you the outcome first. Uh, let's go here. That's July, August, and September. Looking at the the latest update from the Climate Prediction Center. So they're like, hey, still looks like Western Corn Belt's going to be dry. And on top of that, let's just let's just go to their website, CPC, and look at their seasonal drought outlook. Yeah. I mean, they're still this. They made this on Mar- uh, May 31st. They're still. Okay worried about this area and you say well why are they so worried about it and i just say uh let's do this this is one of my favorite websites tropical tidbits i'm going to go over to his analysis tools look at the ocean temperatures and and you look at them compared to average and we've got this we've got cold water here we still have the remnants of a decaying la nina and what i'm going to tell you is if you get cold water there and there and it also shows up here then what that tends to produce produce high do is produce high pressure in the midsection of the of the United States. And when that happens, I think I actually have this up here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, maybe I don't. But what, what that'll end up doing, uh, let's just go back to this map, was it'll end up it'll end up putting high pressure there, high pressure here, and high pressure over here, meaning that we're gonna basically take the Bermuda High and shove it to the North Atlantic, leaving space for a big high pressure cell in the mid part of the country. And then pushing this over here. But let, let me just tell you something. All of this rain that just came down here 
means that that style of big summer drought has gone from about a 60% chance of happening, okay, almost down below 50-50. We're now down to about a 45% chance of it occurring. Okay. So we've, we've reduced it. And okay. I was, like I said, if, if we brought this all in wet, we mentioned this a commodity. We're like, if it all comes in wet, boy, we're going to have a hard time building in anything other than regional drought pressures going into summer. Okay. So, so you've kind of pulled back a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, there's still chance, but it's, it's, you know, it hasn't gotten worse. It's probably if anything's gotten a little, a little better, I guess, of getting well, some presets into those areas. Yes, but let's let's think about it. If you said, Eric, where's the garden spot? I'd say it's along I-80 right there, okay? Yeah. Even though it's been drier, I still think they've had enough rain. You have to remember that those guys in Ohio, southern Indiana, the Ohio River Valley, and this region here, they have either had to mud in a crop, they've not gotten to get in there and do first application, they've done prevent plant along the delta, and then you have, I mean, this is more spring wheat than anything, but you have this big section that's been flooded out. And we look at that and say, well, there's probably a problem on the opposite side of the drought discussion where it's been so wet here. And then we got a forecast, you know, look at this, look at this whole area going back over wet again as we get up there to June 10th. And now the scenario is, what are they going to do with so much water? Because at some point it will dry out and it's going to be crusty and it's going to be problematic. So it's the, the disparity in precipitation that I think is the narrative here. It's been too much on the extremes of both ends of the spectrum to say that this crop is going to be big. So I would ask you this, Matt. Uh, all right. If the USDA, I'm just going to write on this slide here, it says 181. And I were to say, nope, I think it's more like a 176 and a half. Okay. That's just based off of some really simple modeling. But let's knock this down four and a half bushel. Or wait, is that four and a half? That, you know, we're going to knock it down to 166. Uh, excuse me, 176 to 177, yeah. somewhere in that range. Mm-hmm. Is that enough of a beat down on the total national yield for corn to get us to have sustained corn prices above five bucks? I think it would go a long ways to get us closer to five bucks. It would depend on how much demand we can maintain. Because usually a lot of times when the price goes up, you, you, you know, from those lower yields, you're going to lose a little bit of demand. But uh but yeah, you you might might see us be a similar pattern to last year. I think you'd be in that four seventy five to five dollar range. Um, you know, I'd have to run the numbers, but yeah, it would it would definitely be positive and friendly the market. Yeah, but I don't have any hope in it at this point. Yeah. I've been surprised too many times by what looked like bigger problems that didn't turn out to be bigger problems. But it's like you said earlier; it's June the third. You know, we we. This discussion needs to happen on August the 3rd and again on September yeah. the 3rd. And then then we will be able to truly see the magnitude of the issues. But I'll just come back to something important here, okay? We've got to watch this area. If that region begins to cool off where I put that C over the next uh, 30 to 40 days, then prolonged summer heat is going to be a problem. But until yeah. then, I don't have it, any evidence to overturn it. One more thing, I'll let you go. So it... it it seems to me that the, I mean, this isn't the first time this has happened where we've been dry in the West and, and wet in the East. It's, it's mm-hmm. if anything, we get to the end and the crop poops out. It, we get to August <laughs> and it gets really hot and dry and we lose a little bit of yield because of that. Now it, it, that it's, it's crops, right? It's agriculture that happens, but it just seems like it's happened almost every year, the last five years. And and I, is that a cyclical thing? Is there anything that you can see or can point to of why that seems like it's it's happening more often? I guess where you know before what yeah it happened one year and then you go several years without it happening, but it just seems like it's been happening a lot. Uh, and, and that's and that's my experience. Now that being said, we were in the flood area uh, last year in June where we got you know. 10 or 15 inches on top of already saturated soils in a short amount of time. But by August or September, there were cracks in the ground. It was so dry. And so we went from one extreme to the other. So I would tell you that if there's some cyclical behavior to this, it's because we are at this bottom point uh, for the last five, six years in something called the PDO. It's just, 
a measure of North Pacific pressure and temperature patterns with respect to the ocean. All right. When it does that, we, we tend to see more volatile flip-flops. So spring of 23, bone dry around the Great Lakes, corn belt, super dry when we planted the crop. But then it completely flipped in, in midsummer and it got stormy and wet and the crop finished fine. Then we go into 2024. You were flooded out. Much of the rest of the corn belt was dry. And then what happened by the time we got to the uh, end of June and July? Things started to flip. And then by the time we got to August, September, October, it was record dryness on uh, the, the Mississippi Basin, Missouri Basin. So we've now seen just in the last two years alone, complete flips in the pattern from one season to the next. And based off of just persistence, we'd have to say, well, should we be on the lookout for that now? In other words, where we've been so wet, you know, should we just expect a, a complete reversal? And I, I put that up against longer term trends and the longer term trends for us, I mean, now you're part of Iowa. Uh, you're actually in the last, since 2020, you're off total rainfall by about 30, 35 inches. Okay. So in five years time, your deficits are about 35 inches. Can you believe that? You're missing a whole year's worth I of actually, rainfall. I actually can. That that's, yeah. that makes sense. There was uh, a, one, one year, it was probably a few years ago, I mean, the whole season, the whole crop that got planted, I want to say had uh, 10 inches of rain um, to, to allow that, that crop to grow. And that was it, which is, you know, a third of what the normal should be. But then you go east and you come over into the eastern Corn Belt or Kentucky, Tennessee, parts of Illinois, our longer term trend is up on precip. I mean, parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, mid-south. In the last 50 years, during the growing season alone, they're wetter by four or five inches. So it's rare that they're talking about drought. They're instead talking about too much too much rainfall most of the time. The other part of this is where is the trend in the temperatures? We've actually been having pretty normal, you know, April, May frosts, but we're getting some extra heat at the end of the season in, in, in October, November. Now, we don't usually get to use much of that heat because it's, at the end of the crop's life cycle. But, you know, if we just look at some of these trends, those are some of the things I'm watching for. So I would just say this, find the Mississippi, go east of it, you've got wetter trends, go west of it, you've got drier trends overall. Um, that's been the longstanding, you know, 40, 50 year trend. But I'll tell you what, the flip-flops in these last three years have been pretty, pretty, I don't even want to use the word amazing because that makes it sound like I thought they were great. They weren't, they were terrible. They had a lot of impact on our growers but uh, yeah, that's what I'm seeing right now, Matt. I know a lot of our, our viewers are probably familiar with you, but if they want to find you on YouTube or any place, is there a place to go? I know you're 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 back at Nutrient and you're having a new new newsletter. Or, or, yeah. Or, uh, where, where do they go to find you? Yeah, so I'm going to finish that newsletter as soon as you and I are off this call. Um, we're going to release it once a week, but right now the best way to do it, you can go two ways. Uh, go to YouTube and just search up Nutrient Act Solutions. You'll find all our YouTube content there. We produce a video every morning. Uh, but I also have a website that all this goes to as well. It's simple. It's ag-wx.com. Everything on there. Go get access to it. Play around. See what you want to see. And it's loaded with maps and nerdy stuff. So have a good time. ag-wx.com. Well, very good, Eric. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Have a good one. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.